So um, the decision trees, what I'm going to talk about today is the intent and scope. In other words, what these decision trees are and what they're meant to do and what they are not. Um, the underlying concepts on which we built these trees and the current status. Um, now you'll all see lots of um, images of trees. I use the metaphor of trees all the way through this presentation. Um, oops. I don't want to do that just yet. And one of the reasons I use the trees and, uh, is partly because the name kind of organically grew that we would call them decision trees, but also because what we wanted to do, we have all the legislative language and all the beliefs and attitudes and knowledge we have about abuse and neglect and perceptions, but what we really need is to have, some, how to have a useful tool that was grounding and that was going to bring all that stuff grounded for the licensee and the inspector's benefit as to what does the legislation actually mean um, if, if uh, you're informed about abuse and neglect. And so I use that image of trees a lot through this whole presentation. The real underlying reason, I mean the intent and the scope is one thing, but the real underlying reason is this. This is the reason why um, we are all, even though we may have differing opinions, all Family Council, OARC, the Ministry, Advocacy Groups, ACE, everybody, uh, volunteers, everybody is, sent, is on the same page about the reason that we are interested and the reason we do the work we do and the reason we're so passionate about bringing our ideas. Um, and what I want to say, and they, I was given permission to use these, this is Bob and this is Millie, and Bob and Millie are presidents of their respective residence councils, and they are members of the board of directors of the Ontario Association of Residence Councils. It's a great privilege of mine that I happen to also be the ministry liaison for OARC, so I get to go to all their board meetings, and it's just, it's, it's the best, it's the best morning. I always look forward to it. And Bob and Millie, these folks photos were taken at a Ministry employment, Employee Engagement Day where the, the Deputy Minister uh, brought together all people in the Ministry of Health who de have anything to do with long-term care. And as you can well imagine, and I'm sure as you'll all nod your heads, sometimes the right hand doesn't know what the left hand's doing in the Ministry. And so it was a really great opportunity to uh, find it for everybody to talk to everybody else about, yeah, we do the finance stuff with long-term care. Yes, we do the inspection stuff with long-term care. Yeah, we do policy planning and a lot of the, and yes, we do the quality stuff. And so uh, it's really, and uh, the senior strategy folks were there. It was really a great, and but the real highlight of the day for everybody was there and a real eye opener for a lot of people who maybe had not ever stepped in a long-term care home was to have the presentations that were done by uh, the uh, presidents of residence councils who came and spoke. And so Bob and Millie are signing the whole strategic planning board from those days. So I always like to, to point them out and they gave me permission to use their photos. So thanks Dee and Donna on behalf of uh, th there is very confusing. Donna Fairley's the executive director of OARC, so she's Donna one and I'm Donna two when we correspond. <laughs> All right, so what is the intent of these trees? I'm now slide 11. Okay, is to provide that visual aid that I mentioned to support or root the decision making about how, what licensees have to do to report alleged suspected or witnessed abuse or neglect. It is to educate and guide licensees and the sector staff to appropriately report at, um, as required in legislation. What I said at the beginning about the pendulum swinging um, is that uh, what we want is the gold, what I call the Goldilocks principle, is um, it's appropriate reporting. It's not under-reporting, it's not over-reporting, it's the right reporting, it's the appropriate uh, reporting because um, you know certainly places there were reports coming in that were not uh, required to be reported at all but we also are very aware and certainly as our inspectors go out and things come float to the to their notice even though they're not there on that uh, particular reason that in fact of course as we know that there are also some uh, times where things that should be reported are not so it's the right reporting the not too much the not too little the right appropriate reporting and so the the trees were developed to help also educate and guide our inspectors 
who of course need to know intimately what the expectation of the licensees is and therefore um, what they should be inspecting on and what the questions they should be asking when they inspect. The primary users of these trees are the licensees and our PICB inspectors and that's why I came with a little trepidation and a little hope that um, you wouldn't glaze over <laughs> through, the, through the next little while. But everybody still looks pretty perky, so thanks for the coffee this morning, Lorraine. <laughs> I won't take credit for that. Um, and what I want to say is license, this is not a mandatory directive from the ministry, so licensees are not required to post. So if you're a person who kind of keeps your eye out um, and just notices, like, uh, is the home posting what they're supposed to be posting, this is not required to be posted. And in fact, you actually have a little altered version of the trees because um, the decision trees that went to the licensee, we wanted it to make one-stop shopping, and so we actually put the after-hours pager right on the decision trees, because in, in building these trees, and having been there myself, my thought was always, what about that registered nurse at 11 o'clock on a Sunday evening of a holiday weekend? and somebody comes to her or she witnesses or she just knows that something happened that was not right and she's kind of stuck and stranded and you know and that's not the time to be leafing through for you that just kind of outlines what's in the package and the reason and the intent behind it. There's a legislative references chart which I also put in your package that uh, will show up in another slide or two in bigger print that says exactly what pieces of the legislation fed into these decision trees. Um, and there were a couple of memos that I didn't copy for you, but I tell you the content as we go through anyway. Um, there was a director's memo uh, early on when the legislation came out from Tim Burns, who was the director of the time. And it, was, it contained some charts and instructions to the licensees about what they had to report and how they had to report it and when they had to report it. And those, uh, those are still true directions. They d we just hope we've made them into a little more visual, easy to follow uh, way. And, um, Recently, Mar end of March, beginning of April, um, there was a director's memo. In the legislation, it talks about, and this is about reporting timelines, that if a licensee can't get all the information to report back to the ministry of their final report in the 10 days that they're required, then the director could uh, elect to give them a bit of an extension. Well, um, in the legislation, it doesn't say an exact amount of time, but this director's memo says it is 21 days. So the home, the absolute final, final report has to come to the ministry by the 21 days. Um, and the set of the six decision trees went in the package as well. Slide 14, this is the chart that, that also is uh, provided in your package um, to show you which parts of the legislation uh, we actually addressed to put into the, de the uh, decision trees. Um, the, um, oh, sorry, here we go. Let me get my laser here. The, this section 23 is the whole section about the licensee must investigate, respond, and act um, reports of investigation and how they have to report their manner of reporting. We didn't, uh, in the decision trees, um, it's, it's not the purpose of the decision trees to, help, to walk through or, or uh, break down that section 23, 
but it is certainly a very parallel and required and essential process and expectation. And so you will see mention of that section 23 requirements on every one of the decision trees as a, as a constant reminder that they also need to be doing this piece, the investigate, respond and act piece, as well as the piece about how, what what do they report to the ministry and how soon. And in fact, we also say, because the language in the legislation says immediately in both of those cases, well, what's immediate and what's immediate? Kind of what's your first immediate and what's, what's not the very first immediate. And we always, uh, in speaking to the licensees and the homes, have emphasized that their immediate is that they respond in the moment, that they make sure that people are safe within the home, and that then and then they worry about the immediate reporting to the ministry. But their first duty is to immediately invest er, to respond, act, and investigate and start their investigation at least. So we wanted to make that always in their mind, so you'll see it on every decision tree. Uh, the re uh, the rest you'll see actual reference in the decision trees. Um, section this section seventy nine. Um, it isn't on the trees, but it, it, it's kind of background, the, ba the wallpaper information that, that feeds in it. There are certain staff who do not have to report, um, but it's very restricted as who, who that would be. Um, and then at the bottom, we also included for the licensee's benefit, the links so that it's easy access to the, the pieces of legislation that, uh, that they would need to be aware of, the Criminal Code and the Long-Term Care Home Act, the, the law and the regulations. Um, we, of course, uh, not any of us, are uh, line and verse of the Criminal Code, nor are we expected to be, nor are the homes are, uh, expected to be. But uh, what we did, a lot of that in, in the Section 23, um, and actions and requirements lead on to a section called Section 98, which is about informing police. And that's always been a big puzzle and bewilderment. And I remember when I worked in the sector, you know, 25 years ago, that was a question too, if something came to your attention, do you report to the police, don't you? Um, uh, and uh, lots of uh, gray area and confusion there, which still exists. So that's why we did work with uh, Robin Sanders from the OPP, who was really helpful, and Durham Region. And uh, what, uh, there's still some more work to come with this to put things into plain language. But what we tried to do to help the homes and the licensees was integrate or, or say a little bit of the relationship between the Act, the Long-Term Care Home Act, and here's the Section 98 reg that I was mentioning about ensuring the appropriate police force is immediately notified. Um, but the key uh, here is that the incidents that the licensee suspects may constitute a criminal offense. Well, it's like, well, we don't know the criminal code. How do we know what constitutes a criminal offense? Well, there's some really pretty obvious things, and those, uh, those are the things that probably would come to mind if something is being talked about with abuse and neglect. And so uh, Durham Region Police had done this actually on a poster and were kind enough to let us adapt and use it as well. And Robin uh, and, um, and I are doing some work that uh, we hope that we're going to be able to put a few bullet points under some of these because, of course, as in every piece of legislation, there's the, in this case, in this case, this criteria, this standard, you know. And so um, we're hoping to put some plain language and, and there, therefore help the licensees a little bit more. Um, but the, the pinky purple is, um, are the headings, the definitions that come in our Long-Term Care Home Act. And these would be possible ways they would relate to the criminal code. So um, this is uh, a first step, and actually hopefully more than a first step, that was of some help. And we did get feedback from licensees that in fact it has been helpful to them. We also know in relation to the police, I'll just talk a little bit about this, that it varied very uh, widely across the province that when a home would call the police, they got everything from the, um, what are you calling us for this for, to um, being there with three uniformed officers on the front steps with the sirens blazing, which of course may also not be the appropriate kind of response, and everything in between. And so um, that's the reason for the education and the big push uh, through the OPP and through the regional police, but trying to get some consistency on the justice side about how to respond and, um, and, and um, 
not to downplay when people do call. And I think now there's a, a better understanding on the, the police side about um, anybody is free to call and then um, the police kind of are able to say, well, that is in the scope or it's not in the scope. But um, we're hoping that people, and, I, and I'm not just meaning licensees, I'm meaning anybody who feels there's a need to call should still f should feel free to call. And um, if you happen to be rebuffed by, because yeah, often it's like a duty officer or somebody taking, uh, taking information, is to ask if that department has a, an elder a senior specialist, because more and more are. And um, actually, I don't have the list, but Robin Sanders from uh, the OPP has a list uh, across Ontario, and that more there is now more understanding. And I think that as well, media has really helped with that too, because of the TV ads that have been on about seniors, uh, care and seniors abuse, as well as, of course, all the, the other media and the work of the task force and everything. So there's that growing awareness. So we hope that that continues. So um, I certainly remember as being an administrator in homes myself now 20 years ago calling and uh, police saying like that's not our business or if you were calling saying I think there might be financial abuse they'd say oh that's not a criminal matter that's a civil matter you know and and so uh, one thing uh, Robin Sanders and Tammy Rankin said is use the get a little into the jargon as well um, and when if uh, if you're calling it thinking that there might be financial abuse going on that you don't say we think there's uh, financial abuse but that you think there's theft by power of attorney that's a criminal code term <laughs> and then so so you know then you're less likely to get the response about well you know you're just calling because the the resident or whoever the family owes you money licensee you know too bad for you go through uh, small claims court no that's not the issue the issue is it theft by power of attorney okay the abuse decision trees uh, slide 16 this is just a list there are six definitions in the long-term care home act and regs that deal with abuse and neglect and so there is a decision tree that relates to each one of them so what i'd like to do now and i would suggest probably although we will have them on the screen that you might actually want to take out the handout uh, that has uh, some slightly kinder print <laughs> uh, to the eyes of the decision trees